single student deeply understood the complexity of the social problems in New Orleans and felt a deep connection to the local community. Um, but building on that, um, there's been a huge sense of interest in social innovation and social entrepreneurship that very much go hand in hand. And so a lot of the students are asking the question, not only how can we work with and support local community organizations, but how can we think about staying long term in New Orleans, launching our own organizations that benefit the community, or how can we together you know, work on different interventions that are having uh, a, a you know, a real measurable impact in the New Orleans community. So there's a lot of uh, working together between the service learning professors and social innovation across Tulane and in the New Orleans community. And uh, they recently launched a $100 million capital campaign focused on change making that would allow, you know, funding for more teaching and research and community partnerships that would kind of be at the intersection of service learning and social innovation. Another very different example is Marquette University, which has Jesuit roots. And they very much see that um, there's a, a very strong sense of service that's built into the mission and DNA of their core values. Uh, they even have a vice president of mission and, and values um, who, who really talks about how social innovation and a lot of the analytical tools that they're teaching in their social innovation classes are really useful as a complement to help students understand not just how to have service in the community, but how to really understand impact and how to measure impact. Um, and they're, they're particularly focused on interdisciplinary learning, and it was actually Marquette that we had our first faculty institute and worked closely with different chemistry and statistics um, and anthropology and women's studies professors as well. And this is just a sign from the University of San Diego. Um, at their recent commencement, they had Bill Drayton as the commencement speaker, um, but they, they also are putting out that their values are around change making and that this is, this is both how they're recruiting students, talking about, you know, don't come to the University of San Diego if you don't want to come to the, learn how to make a difference in the world, just don't even come because this is what we're about, but also in terms of commencement and students graduating, this was the whole framing around the commencement ceremony. And so, you know, trying to get a grasp on all the different moving pieces, um, ultimately it, it starts with student demand and it starts with students asking the questions, you know, how do I complement a lot of the existing work I'm doing in classrooms or existing work I'm doing in the community or existing work I'm, you know, trying to figure out how to forge my future career path. Um, how do I uh, think about um, uh, you know, from a faculty perspective, um, there a lot of people are doing socially entrepreneurial things in different contexts or doing work with communities. How do you in, in, infuse this into what you're doing in the classroom? Um, but uh, we're really finding that uh, it's it's a huge growth in demand uh, from students, and that faculty are eager and excited to get more involved. Um, and we're really looking at the change maker campuses to help kind of forge the way forward. And so we really see all of you as co-collaborators and co-experimenters um, to really uh, figure this out with us. And then I will more just show you some photos that, you know, there is a growing, growing global movement. Here's a, a panel of university presidents from other change maker campuses um, that are talking about why they're building in social entrepreneurship as a core value to their universities. Here's um, a TEDx I showed you we did last year. Um, and really, ultimately, at the end of the day, you know, it's driven by students, but universities aren't going to be able to, to bring in a lot of this content without you. Um, so faculty really have a lot of the power and the influence to transmit these ideas to students, and you're looked to as mentors, you're looked to as advisors, you're looked to as, you know, research, um, uh, collaborators and so I think you know you are in a very unique position of being able to both model the values of social change and social impact um, but also teach about them. So we'll move on from here but any I saw a hand. Uh, yeah I just um, you had a slide that showed the different modeling um, of mm -hmm. actual implementation on the campuses mm -hmm. and I don't know if that's something that you're going to address further 
this afternoon, this these specific differences? If so, I can wait. But I'm just wondering um, exactly what you mean by the, the dual model with the Ashoka's globalizers to match scaling. If you could tease that out a little bit. Yeah, that's actually, um, Duke recently got um, a, a grant from USAID, from their new university global solutions uh, initiative. And so we're helping to partner with them on, you know, Duke is known for doing research on how to scale social impact. And so um, we have an, at Ashoka an initiative called Globalizer that's taking the most globally scaled social entrepreneurs in our network to understand and do research on how did they do it, and how do we learn from this global scale? And so we've been collaborating with Duke as a research partner on that. Okay. I think we're, we're running uh, about an hour behind, so we're going to get crafty here. Um, but let's go ahead and take um, our break. We're just going to shorten it a little bit. So we're going to do um, like an up to 10 minute break, I think, and then we're going to um, continue with Max's this portion of the break. Okay. Okay.
third point, and I think this is a point that's very important for anyone involved in higher education, talent. And what young people want. You know, ultimately, you know, I've been involved in education now for over 10 years. Um, I think our function is to put appropriate knowledge and skills at the fingertips of our students um, who will then do something with it. But of course, the student population, what drives people, is also changing. And here, I, I personally find this quite encouraging. You can see that the importance of doing something that is responsible or meaningful is actually rising. And I have to say, you know, when I taught my, my first courses in this field, um, you know, often you would get students who were really curious, but it didn't really have a big impact on the career choices necessarily initially. Whereas now, very often you get, especially bright students, who say, well, you know, I have multiple options now that I'm graduating, but I'd like really to do something with my talent, with my skills, with my life energy, if you will, um, that I can be proud of. And I think these are very encouraging developments. And uh, I think some of you may be thinking, but are we doing this anyway? Yes, of course you're doing this already. But what is powerful about social entrepreneurship is that it has become a movement. So you see more and more individuals in a student population, uh, outside universities as well, obviously, among educators, in the world of NGOs, in the world of business, in the world of government, innovators, basically, who see that this is a powerful way of motivating people, organizing them differently, having them partner differently, and drive positive change. And uh, I think those are really key reasons why we should at least explore whether or not to make an effort on teaching social entrepreneurship. Um, because it's a powerful solution spectrum. It's just, it's just another way at contributing to something positive. Um, I think what, what really happens here is, um, and I think this has been alluded to by many of you when you are sharing your own work, is we see a convergence of the sectors here. It doesn't really mean, of course, that the world of the NGO, the world of business, the world of government, everything is going to become the same sort of one skew that is unrecognizable. No, I'm not suggesting that. But increasingly, if you're in the social sector, uh, you have to be more accountable to the results that you're creating. It's not just I'm doing the right thing, therefore I'm virtuous. Of course, it's good to be doing the right thing, but people will still increasingly ask, what are you achieving in doing the right thing? Are you actually helping and empowering the people you want to empower? Secondly, in the world of business, I think, and the financial crisis has, of course, uh, brought this to the forefront, uh, we see tremendous skepticism with the established way of doing things. And Increasingly, people want economic value creation to be done with values, adhering to values at the same time. And that's interesting. It creates a new field of forces, a new constraint that, that companies need to react to. And again, where talent, new ideas, new role models will be very powerful. In fact, increasingly, the world of government is exploring what it can do, because one of the things that we uh, see in the OECD countries with the over indebtedness is, of course, that the welfare state as we know it need reforming if we still want to provide public goods on a scale that is required with an aging society, um, with a global, in a globalizing world where we have more and more communities, migrants and so on, where classical interventions just don't cut it in a normal finance. So there is an overall context that is shifting in which we release our students once they graduate. And I think it is our responsibility in educating them to help them navigate that. So that when they make career choices later on, they know more or less what the field of forces looks like. And I think that's personally what has been driving me for the, the past 10 years or so in this space, that you can see that social entrepreneurs is a powerful entry point to that conversation, to that reflection. It doesn't mean you know, that we're in a position to help every student figure out what they should be doing in life. I think that'd be a bit of a tall order. But it's a very productive, I would like to argue, a very productive way of enabling your students to exploring things, making sense of what they see around them, and frankly motivating them to do things that they consider boring, like accounting, for example, or chemistry, but that are really important. You know, because we all know that if you don't acquire certain skills, you can be as well-intentioned as you want to be later on. So I think there is a, there's a certain uh, case, simply if you look at the environment, I'll get to in a second. Um, 
why this is relevant. Now, if we look at the US in particular, I would not argue, and please uh, excuse me for taking a uh, perspective, we have a lot of problems, problems in Europe as well, so feel free to point those out in the break or whatever you'd like to, as you know. But, you know, we have certain things that are empirical problems. I mean, they're not theoretical. Think about obesity and its implications for uh, health costs, for example. Think about rising poverty. Think about the fact that in the United States, uh, for the first time, the younger generation is not, at least not currently, on a trajectory to being better educated than the older generation. Now, of course, this is partially because of high enrollment and achievement levels already, but it's nevertheless a real paradigm change, if you think about it. And you know, in the world, of, if you're active in the world of education, you think about what that means, and then of course the whole thing about demographics. So you know, I would argue that I think we'll circulate these slides later. That we have serious issues here also that we need to deal with. And again, our working hypothesis for the day will be: this is social entrepreneurship is one vector that you should consider, not the only one. You know, I'm neither suggesting you should do away with private initiative nor with government. I think it's an ecosystem. But it's an interesting ingredient to the ecosystem, a relatively recent ingredient to the ecosystem. Now, um, I have to say, we do a lot of work in, uh, in the climate space, and uh, there as well. You know, clearly, I think we need new kinds of solutions, new ideas, how we make, uh, I would say, intelligent climate policy and climate action happen. And again, wouldn't it be a good idea to have more people, more innovators in the pipeline to produce good <laughs> ideas? So that hopefully some of them can then be rolled out on a scale that makes a difference. Now, I would argue, and I hope I convinces you somewhat. I don't know, Charlie, if you're not fully convinced, I can see it. We'll get to that in a second. Question. Is Ashoka an entrepreneurial organization, or is it a, basically getting money from the nonprofit sector to run itself? Like well, I mean, you know, first of all, uh, let me, well, we'll get to what social media are in a second, but I think you're raising a very important point. Um, Ashoka is organized as a non-profit, but we shouldn't think about the dichotomy. Being a non-profit means you cannot be entrepreneurial, right? I mean, being entrepreneurial at the end of the day, uh, and you pointed out earlier that it's a loaded word, you know, we may agree or disagree with it. I think, ultimately, it's not about discourse. It's really about bringing new solutions and providers of new solutions into the game so that they can play, that they can improve the same as well. I think that is, that's what it's about. And so on, which is really one term, it could also call it social innovation uh, or, or differently. Um, of course, Ashoka is a highly entrepreneurial organization. Because Ashoka has helped over the past 32 years to induce parent change in a number of areas. And I'll give you one example, maybe of, uh, of a fellow who we'll get to later when we talk about course design, which is uh, part of the next, uh, one of the next inputs. You know, think about the world of, um, of unnecessary blindness. Use the microphone, please. Yeah. Think about the world, can you hear me like this? Maybe I'm too tall. Uh, think about the world of unnecessary blindness. So according to the WHO, there are over 40 million people in the world who suffer from unnecessary blindness. Now, 80% of those could be helped if they had cheap cataract operations. Now, for us here, and again in Europe, that's in a way solved, right? I mean, maybe only if I don't go to my doctor, I will not be able to get that, right? However, in developing countries, it's not the case. Now, a social entrepreneur out of the Ashoka universe, in fact, recognized that and created a, uh, a cheap system, uh, a, a, an eye care uh, hospital system, um, in India to actually make current operations much cheaper. And then in the process realized, well, you know, to really drive down costs, it's not enough to just organize ourselves efficiently. We need the inputs much cheaper. So if a cataract lens costs, say, over $125, well, that's not very good. You know, people uh, you know, live off a dollar, two dollars a day. So what they managed to do uh, with the help, and I think that's the power of the Shoka network, with involved who have ideas, insights, connections, was set up a non-profit, and again, to your point about non-profits, a non-profit pharma company called Orolab that produces these intraocular lenses at a much lower cost, so that you can sell them actually for about $4 a pair. And they have completely changed the business model 
in the global interoperable lens industry, where it was relatively low volumes and high margins to much higher volumes and much lower margins. And I would argue that this is something entrepreneurial to do. It benefits the people out there because you can now conduct more operations at a lower cost. And yet it is something that, you know, could you have could they have done this in and in a by themselves? Would it is this the simplest way uh, to be entrepreneurial? Maybe not. But it's a powerful combination of trying to make a difference with using the tools of markets and business. And I think this is one of the aspects uh, that you will see, and we'll get to that case a bit later uh, after, the, after the break. This is a great case uh, also for, for course design. These are the kinds of things, I'll get to in a second, that social entrepreneurs do. And it is inspiring. I mean, it drives real change. It's inspiring. But it also, especially in the education environment, creates lots of ideas as to what else one could be 